It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. With me today, Conservative MP Connor Burns, Labour MP Rosie Duffield, the Chief Executive of the cross-party think tank Demos, Polly McKenzie, and LBC radio presenter Ian Dale. Today, Boris Johnson's former Chief Advisor Dominic Cummings has renewed his attack on the Prime Minister's handling of the pandemic. Partly, well, this is terrible, but the people who are dying are essentially all over 80, and we can't kill the economy just because of people dying over 80. Last night is just another stop in his revenge tour, isn't it? Boris Johnson is also under fire for saying clubbers will need two jabs from September. We're planning to make full vaccination the condition of entry to nightclubs and other venues where large crowds gather. And what if these two became these two? We take a look at the what-ifs of politics. So, Dominic Cummings, Boris Johnson's former chief advisor, has continued to make explosive allegations about the Prime Minister's handling of the pandemic. In his first TV interview with the BBC's political editor, Laura Kunzberg, he makes a series of damaging claims. Now, we're going to talk about the substance of those in just a moment, but you will have heard Ruth Davidson, the former leader of the Scottish Conservatives, in the headlines, saying that Dominic Cummings was on a revenge tour. Uh, let me start with a question to all of you about that. Connor, is it lesser revenge? Revenge tour a more a revealing insight into the Prime Minister's personal handling of the crisis from the man closest to him at the time. Look, I think Ruth Davidson was right. Dom is hell-bent on revenge and he's operating to the law of diminishing returns. He's saying the same thing over and again. We had what felt like three days worth of evidence at the Science and Health Joint Select Committee. Um, now we've upgraded to a Laura Kunzberg uh, interview. I feel very sad about this. Uh, he made an enormous contribution to the Brexit campaign and to the 2019 election, but he's clearly determined to do the Prime Minister harm. I watched the snippets last night and I couldn't help but think of what Margaret Thatcher said of Geoffrey Howe's resignation statement, where she said, wielding the knife cleverly, too cleverly, that in the end it wasn't my record he assassinated. He assassinated his own character. Rosie, is it a revenge tour? Um, it's pretty sordid, isn't it? And very, very childish. And I'm not entirely sure what Mr Cummings is after. But if there's any truth to what he's saying, that's also really shocking. I hope it isn't true. I hope the Prime Minister doesn't just have a completely callous disregard for all of the thousands of people in that age group that we've lost during this pandemic, because that's really quite horrific if he does. Polly, what's your assessment? Is he a man that we should be listening to? I think, you know, Dominic's great tragedy is that he needs to exist in a world where truth matters and where the statements of political leaders or senior advisers are taken seriously and thought to have meaning. And yet he is one of the major architects of a, of a political environment in which truth has been almost collapsed in on itself that statements only matter for the instant and, and don't last and don't need to have substance or meaning. So in a way, he feels Cassandra-like. You know, he's, he's saying what mm. he believes to be true and no one believes him because no one believes anything anymore and it's his fault. Ian, what picture, though, does it paint the, the, the parts of the interview that we've already heard of Boris Johnson's personal handling of the pandemic? Well, it doesn't paint a particularly good one, but that clearly is Dominic Cummings' objective. It's really difficult to sort the wheat from the chaff here because clearly a lot of what he says is based on fact. I don't deny that at all. But it is very unedifying for a former government advisor to betray the trust of a prime minister in this way because government can't operate unless there is a trust between the politicians 
and their advisors. Advisors need to speak truth unto power and tell politicians when they think they're getting something wrong. In the end, it's up to the politicians to make the decisions. But if the politicians can't trust their advisors not to go public after they leave office, you're not going to have these conversations that, that need to be had. So I think it's all very unedifying. Right. I mean, Connor, at the, the beginning there, Ian did say that some of these things have actually come to pass. And in that sense, this was a man who worked day in and day out with Boris Johnson. Isn't it important to know what was going through the mind of Boris Johnson at the time of this crisis? Well, look, I acknowledge, uh, I acknowledge what I said a moment ago, uh, Dom's immense contribution to our public life in recent years. This is, you know, they're all saying about a revenge being a dish served cold. This is a revenge on loop. And it is, as everyone's saying, unedifying. But judge the Prime Minister not by what Dominic Cummings said, he said in private. Judge him by the decisions he took, the actions his government implemented, the decisions that we took grappling with the greatest pandemic in a generation. Uh, and I think what Don says and what the Prime Minister he says the Prime Minister said and what the Prime Minister then did are two completely different things. Right, but there was a debate, wasn't there, Rosie, at the heart of every decision that was taken, particularly around the issue of lockdowns and when they should be made, because there was harm done by lockdowns too, was how the argument was set out by people like Boris Johnson. Yeah, and I think the main thing we can take from this is that the, you know, the public have needed to be led by the government to know what's safe. You know, we were in unknown territory and we were dependent, all of us, on the government making these decisions based on sage advice and the most expert people. This is just another way of us looking back and going, who can we trust? And the public have a problem trusting politicians in the first place. So this, this kind of sordid revelation tactic, it just doesn't work. It's, but Rosie, it's isn't, it, isn't it fair that any government would be debating these things? And isn't, yes, isn't it a, a healthy thing that the Prime yeah. Minister was debating in private Absolutely. with his closest advisors, the, the cost benefit? benefits of you know handling it in one way or locking down the yeah, economy. Absolutely. It's very, very difficult. But I think seeing these kind of nitty-gritty, silly, babyish kind of arguments just, just undermines the trust on how that was done, and I think it is really quite embarrassing, actually. Well, let's talk to Laura Kunzberg, the BBC's political editor, who's done the interview. Laura, the whole interview is going to be shown this evening at 7 o'clock on BBC Two, but we've already heard and we've been discussing some of the key lines of your interview with Dominic Cummings. Can you take us through them? Yes, Joe, I mean, one of the serious allegations, probably the most serious allegation that Dominic Cummings, who's clearly disgruntled, makes is that in the autumn in particular, that the Prime Minister was putting his political interests ahead of protecting the lives of citizens. And of course, that is a controversial thing to say. Of course, that is a very serious claim to make. Um, but Dominic Cummings was clearly ready and very determined to make that case to try to give a flavour of that debate you were just talking about that was going on behind closed doors and the suggestion that, in his view, the Prime Minister was extremely hostile to going for another lockdown in the autumn. Let's have a listen to how he described it. Partly, it's all nonsense and lockdowns don't work anyway. And partly, well, this is terrible, but... The people who are dying are essentially all over 80. And we can't kill the economy just because of people dying over 80. It's a very serious claim to make. What evidence do you have of that? Well, lots of people heard the Prime Minister say that. The Prime Minister texted that to me and other people. Um, you know, when the inquiry happens and everyone has to give evidence under oath, like other things that I've said to you today, uh, you know, this is not just me saying this. Many, many people will say under oath to the public inquiry, if and when that ever happens, that what I've said today, what I tell told MPs is true. Now, Downing Street says that look at the facts. The Prime Minister did in the end actually have three national lockdowns and they say that Boris Johnson has always followed the best scientific advice to make decisions to protect people's lives. But I have to say, Joe, there are other insiders who've described to me the atmosphere at that particular time um, in government as being like that, as the Prime Minister being quite hung up, as was described to me over that period of time, about the difference between COVID patients' life expectancy and average life expectancy, that 
but he did say to other members of staff that the first lockdown, perhaps they shouldn't have done it, that he was deeply reluctant to bring in another one back in October. And it's also not been denied that Professor um, Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Balance did go to Downing Street at that point in September and call push for another short, sharp lockdown. Remember that debate over the circuit breaker. And I think what's tricky for Downing Street to explain, and they haven't denied the content of these, are these WhatsApp messages that have also been shared with us that Boris Johnson sent to aides at, at the time, talking about saying, I don't buy this NHS overwhelmed stuff, saying that he thought that hardly anyone under 60 goes into hospital and of those virtually all survive. Folks, I think we may need to recalibrate. There's a maximum of 3 million people in this country over 80. Now, I heard Joe there, Connor Burns, of course, reflecting that, look, you would expect these kinds of backwards and backwards and forwards debates to go on in government. And of course, these were difficult decisions to make. But it does certainly give more ammunition to those people in politics who right now are accusing Boris Johnson of being too cavalier and too reckless about coronavirus. And that's a debate that was just as relevant last autumn. And it's highly relevant today, too. Uh, the government response, Downing Street response? Well, Downing Street, don't deny the content of these WhatsApp messages that I think some people will find quite upsetting to mm. read. But what they do say on the record is that the Prime Minister has brought in three national lockdowns. He has stopped the NHS being overwhelmed. And he has always acted to protect people's lives, bringing in the successful vaccination programme and also the furlough programme to protect millions of jobs. And I think, look, Dominic Cummings speaking out like this, it's really going to drive some people around a twist. You know, he's somebody who many people would love to hate because of the fact he got caught out on his journey to Barnard Castle. But at the same time, you can't completely dismiss this out of hand because he was in the room, not just during the COVID pandemic, but of course also as the architect of the Brexit campaign and Boris Johnson's chief advisor during the torrid autumn when they were trying to get a deal with the European Union and trying to get Parliament mm. to accept what they wanted to do. And there's plenty more on that in tonight's programme too. Well, indeed, uh, Laura, and that is on that interview that you have done with Dominic Cummings on this evening at 7 o'clock on BBC Two. Um, Connor, let's just pick up on the WhatsApp message uh, where Boris Johnson allegedly says, I no longer buy all this NHS overwhelmed stuff. That was at the core of the public message. That sounds like a mistrust of the scientists and doctors advising him. No, I think history would ask what on earth was going on if these debates weren't happening. If the Prime Minister wasn't asking about the economic impact versus the public health But he said he risks. was following the science all the time. And it, indeed, but we will have a life after COVID where we will have the financial implications of that to deal with. Uh, look, I know Boris Johnson well. I was his PPS in the Foreign Office. I was at his side during the leadership campaign. The Prime Minister is somebody who, in private, often uses language, tests you by saying something controversial to gauge a reaction to test the solidity of an argument. Uh, and as Laura said, this will all come out mm. in the public inquiry, and I think history will judge the Prime Minister well. Even if the Prime Minister Rosie had private doubts, the point is the public messaging in the end, and that was stay at home to prevent the NHS being overwhelmed, and that was consistent. Um, yes and no. I think a lot of people were confused about the sort of lockdown systems and Labour were calling for um, one a lot earlier than it did happen, the circuit breaker in uh, half term. And it seemed to have taken quite a long time for the government to reach that decision. But yeah, like Connor said, this all will come out in the public inquiry. And I think then the public have every right to either expect an apology for that kind of language or just really question exactly how he runs his government. Right. I mean, Ian, that's important, isn't it? Because doctors, nurses, support staff, many of them exhausted after months, over a year on the front line, making sure the health service didn't collapse. I don't buy all this NHS overwhelmed stuff. I mean, they're going to be offended by that, aren't they? Well, I don't think we should clutch our pearls too he heavily on this. Connor is absolutely right. All prime ministers test arguments to destruction. Margaret Thatcher certainly did. In cabinet meetings, she would adopt fairly extreme positions and listen to the evidence and, and then come to a slightly different conclusion than people thought she might. And I think that's what's happened here. Mm. But let's think back to that time. The, the, uh, Keir Starmer, everyone was arguing for a two-week circuit breaker. 
The Welsh government did a two week circuit breaker. It had absolutely no effect whatsoever. I've been hugely critical of the prime minister over the past week or so over decisions that they've made. But on that, he was absolutely right. Lockdowns only work if they are probably in excess of a month. Two week lockdowns do not work. Right. Polly, what's your view now um, watching this unfold? How should number 10 handle this interview with Dominic Cummings? I think you know, even just listening to the conversation today, it feels like such an inadequate way to be talking about such important decisions, so many mistakes and so many triumphs throughout our kind of public service system. I think the key thing is to try and move the conversation on and set a date for when the public inquiry is going to start. You know, they quite understandably said that they are busy running the pandemic right now, but actually we've moved to a new phase. So now is a good moment to move the conversation on, talk about what that process is going to look like. And, and for me, I think, you know, the inquiry kind of concept is doesn't feel right. I think we should be thinking of this as a kind of truth and reconciliation process. Everybody made some mistakes. We have learned an extraordinary amount. And if we can come together to learn those lessons in a kind of non-critical way, we can actually go into what may be future pandemics with a, a just greater solidarity and greater understanding and, and not be just, you know, dealing with, matters of such importance as if it's just kind of gossip and hearsay. Right. Would it be better to have the inquiry sooner rather than later, Connor? No, I think it's right that the government continues to focus on the response, focus on getting the economy back on track, making sure that we go in safely to the autumn to save lives, protect the NHS, the usual mantra, uh, and we focus on the public inquiry when COVID is behind us, not still a current reality. Rosie? Yeah, I agree with that. I think we have to get all of the evidence and all of the experts together when we've got through it so that we can learn. And I agree with Polly about it being a collaborative um, way of stopping these things happening again. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. I'm going to show you a couple of headlines because we got an announcement from the Prime Minister on so-called vaccine passports yesterday. This story is on so many of the front pages. If we have a look at the Daily Mail, price of freedom, you will need jab passport. And this is the Metro's front page, which says free cheers. And under the headline, it says club passports on the way. Um, we're going to talk to Silky Carlo, the director of Big Brother Watch. The policy set out by the Prime Minister yesterday is that people in England will need to be double jab in order to go to nightclubs and other large crowded events as a condition of entry to those events by the end of September. Silky, what's your response to that? Well, it's heinous and it's yet another U-turn. There have been so many U-turns on this policy. I don't think anyone can keep up. It's, um, it's deeply counterproductive. I mean, the government's been quite honest that this is about coercing young people to receive a vaccination, but this is not the best way to do it. So much research shows that coercion is counterproductive. Uh, so I really worry that there'll be a backlash to this, and, and quite rightly so, because this is discriminatory and it's deeply illiberal. And there's no trade-off here because it's not going to make people safer, I'm afraid. Uh, we have to look at this at the collective level. Uh, we have to look at the, I mean, in the middle of, at the moment, we're in the middle of a massive wave. Um, we can't pretend that there are these green tick only safe zones um, where people will be perfectly safe. That's just not the case. Right. Well, deeply illiberal and counterproductive, Connor. I have some sympathy with that. Uh, I gave an interview to my local paper, the Bournemouth Echo, back in February, where I said I thought some form of vaccine passport was probably inevitable and that if we were going to go down that route, I'd rather the government did it in a regulated, fair way, rather than have a sort of wild west of different schemes popping up in the private sector. I hope it's not coercion, I hope it's nudge. Uh, it's interesting they've chosen the date of the end of September. The end of September will be the point by which all uh, 18 to 24 year olds will have been offered both jabs. The take up rate so far is only around 60%, which is disappointingly low. I hope that if young people come forward, avail themselves of the vaccination, that we won't need to see this policy implemented. Silky? I think yeah, nothing's inevitable. And it really worries me to, see, to hear a member of parliament saying that they think that this massive, actually constitutional change, you know, we're now, we are now in the territory of asking people to carry papers, is inevitable. I think what members of the public like me want to see is our parliamentarians standing up for our liberties and for our freedoms, asking where the rationale and where the health case is. A parliamentary committee, um, the public uh, 
Affairs and, and uh, co- sorry, Public Administration Constitutional mm. Affairs Committee said there was no health basis for this. No, no scientific basis has been set out. So what I'm asking MPs to do, for goodness sake, get off the bench. This is a massive change. It's going to harm the vaccination programme. It's going to harm people's trust in the government because it, we've seen yet more lies, yet more U-turns. And it's going to harm our liberties. All right. Well, Connor? Well, look, the Prime Minister himself said some months ago that there were deep and complex issues around any form of having to, to prove that you were, were vaccinated. I hope it doesn't happen. And the government are clear that there will be parliamentary scrutiny of this proposal if it comes before. And would you vote against it? I would obviously, Mrs Thatcher once wisely said, never make a decision until you have to. I would wait and see what the legislation said. But I'm very clear that I do not want to see vaccine passports, but I do want to see young people come forward for their own sake and crucially for the sake of their uh, elderly relatives and friends and members of their community to keep everyone safe. All right, Silky, stick with us. Uh, What's your reaction, Rose? Um, I think the government should be concentrating on the people who haven't had the vaccine and trying to find out why and incentivise those people to have it if they're feeling unsure, if they're feeling, you know, perhaps they're breastfeeding or they're pregnant and they're not sure about the the vaccine. I think we need to concentrate on persuading people that it's a good idea and that it's safe rather than sort of this weird system which we don't even know how it would be governed. You know, older people without a printer, what what are they going to do? They can't just go to their doctor and get a certificate from what I understand about these proposals. We don't really know how this would work. And young people have been through an awful lot. Let's persuade them, you know, that the vaccine is a good idea rather than sort of offering this... So you would vote vote against it too? I'm not sure yet. I'd need to see, but it does ring alarm bells. I think there are lots of people who have real concerns about the vaccine. We shouldn't be punishing them. We should be working with them. I mean, Ian, clearly people... People have a right to turn down the vaccines if they want to. They also have the right to go to nightclubs and they've only just reopened. But do people have the right to do both things if that particular combination might put others at risk? Well, the problem here is that the government seem to be saying that nightclubs are unique vectors of COVID. And you can understand why they might say that. Well, if so, why did they open them up um, last night or the, or the night before? Uh, to say that they're going to introduce COVID passports in two months' time may be a backdoor way of encouraging 18 to 24-year-olds to get the vaccine, but at least be honest about it. Um, and what, what are these other events where we would have to have vaccine passports? They, they haven't been clear about that. The, the main One of the main failings, I think, over the past 16 months is the mixed messaging. There doesn't seem to be a clarity of message here. And that is so important from government, whether we're talking about COVID or indeed anything else. People need to understand why they're doing something. And what they could have done is say, look, nightclubs, we think, are really dangerous uh, vectors of, of COVID. So therefore, I'm afraid we're going to keep them closed for the next two months. But here's a support package for all the nightclubs in the country. Um, Now, nightclub owners wouldn't have liked that. But one I talked to last night, um, Jeremy Joseph owns the GAY group of uh, clubs. I mean, he says he feels unsafe in his own clubs. So where does that leave us? (laughs) Right, that's not very reassuring. Um, Is it the thin end of the wedge, Polly? I I don't think it is, though. There is, uh, as people were saying, a lot of unclarity about exactly what kind of venues might qualify you know we had uh, last year all of this confusion about you know what counts as a restaurant what counts as a pub around you know uh, uh, different kinds of snacks that, that qualify as a meal so there needs to be more clarity i think the reason i think we've gone kind of in and out and up and down a sort of hokey pokey on this policy is because it's genuinely quite difficult to implement i, I don't have a kind of in principle objection that it's fundamentally wrong if the health evidence suggests that these are real problematic vectors. And there does seem to be some evidence from the Netherlands, for example, that that is the case. But as Rosie said, it's complicated, right? If you go for a really low intensity uh, system, like, you know, just have to show that little piece of paper they give you when you get your vaccine, well, that's about as fordable as a taxi, you see, right? So it's not going to actually be uh, very effective at making sure people can't get in. On the other hand, if you want a perfectly secure system, you're going to have to both deal with digital exclusion because identifying people who don't have a smartphone is complicated and you're going to worry about privacy. And at that point, I think Silky's concerns about privacy and intrusion become quite serious. So there isn't a kind of perfect way to do this that's, that just makes it easy and certainly doesn't make it easy for nightclub owners who you know, already have to check age ID. Though I guess you know 
given that the vaccinations aren't being offered to under 18s i guess it's another way of getting rid of the under 18s from our nightclubs i don't right. think i've been to a nightclub since i turned 18. <laughs> you're not much older now of course are you polly um rosie keir starmer has previously said vaccine passports go against the british instinct what did you take him to mean by that um, I'm not sure. I don't want to speak for Keir, but I suppose it's just it's all this sort of extra legislation. And we know, for example, you know, just look at what's happened to the Windrush generation. They don't necessarily um, fit the mould, which would be people that have all these um, documents of vaccinations. Also, certain parts of the community are really wary of these vaccines. I don't like the idea of discriminating against them. I think we should be persuading them that it's safe to have the vaccine in the first place. That's where we should be focused, I think. Do you accept there hasn't been clarity uh, of messaging here? Connor on this particularly because nightclubs have only just reopened and here they are facing the fact that they are going to have to monitor and police in some way people having double jabs or passports to gain entry. Well look what I think is that people who watch these sort of programs are sick of politicians uh, on here pretending black is white so look obviously this is a change the government had hitherto said we weren't going down this route they're now indicating we may go down this route. Now, I think Keir Starmer is right that these sort of passports, ID cards, are fundamentally against the British character. The, the, the British way, if you're stopped by a police officer who says, where are you going? You can say to him or her, well, I'm come from up there and I'm going down there. What, if, what do you have, offence do you have in mind that I may be committing, officer? I grew up in Northern Ireland in the early years of my life where you did have to carry mm. your driving licence and present it on demand to the police and security forces. It changes the relationship between the individual and the state. But I think the simple message on this, Joe, if you don't want these sort of passports or certificates or whatever you're going to call them, if you're a young person, you want to go clubbing without them, come forward and get both jabs before the end of September. So could you accept that? I think that I think <clears throat> that threat of coercion is actually the wrong reason to get a vaccination. The reason to get a vaccination is because you think it's in the best interest for your health. And that's why we're seeing massive take up. I think that kind of messaging about, well, if you don't want to have to show your papers, if you don't want to be excluded, if you don't want to be outcast from society, that's why you should do it. Makes some people think, really? Why? What does that mean? And it's that kind of fear and distrust that's going to be embedded in, in the communities that are hardest to reach. Let's bear in mind, this is going to hurt hardest among young people, among women and pregnant women and breastfeeding women, ethnic minorities, low paid workers, all of these people are being left behind by politicians. And I think in particular, it's really incumbent on the Labour Party now, who stands or, or is supposed to stand for these people, to take a very, very clear line on this. All right, Silky Carlo, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to stick uh, with Labour uh, for the moment. I just want to show you this headline in The Guardian. Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, expected to back purge of far-left Labour factions. NEC, that's Labour's national ruling executive, to be asked to prescribe resist. Labour against the witch hunt, socialist appeal and Labour in exile network. I think this is something that is going to be discussed today. We can talk to Andrew Fisher, Jeremy Corbyn's former director of policy. Um, what's wrong with this idea? Well, I think there are a few things. I think prescriptions tend to be a collective punishment for um, membership of organisations, some of which you know we might disagree with on certain things but it ends up capturing individuals who haven't done anything wrong personally themselves. And that's the risk. Um, there are rules already to expel people for various things within the Labour Party, you know, acting against the Labour Party rule book or for anti-Semitism or any other form of bigotry. These sort of prescriptions tend to just end up um, being used for factional purposes. And we're seeing uh, that already in the way it's being described. Rosie? Um, obviously, I'm going to disagree with Andrew on them um, as an MP whose life was made really pretty difficult by groups like Labour Against the Witch Hunt. I don't see that they have any particularly positive influence on the Labour Party. They seem to only exist to kind of troll and make life, dif life difficult for MPs they don't like and who uh, may have taken stands against Jeremy Corbyn. I don't like the factionalism in the party. It is a real issue and it has probably always been an issue. But I don't know that, I don't know half of these groups, but I trust Keir Starmer and I trust that he wants to make a change. Right. Would well, you accept that? That's a personal experience there, Labour against the witch hunt, that actually only there, in Rosie's words, to troll MPs like her. Well, look, if there, if there are people acting in ways that are bullying or abusing, then they, they can be expelled under existing rules. What I would say is, look, there are people who have been... Uh, suspended for various reasons recently, some justly, some unjustly, uh, as it happens, and some people obviously get reinstated. So to campaign against that 
inherently isn't a problem to campaign against, you know, to campaign for somebody to be reinstated. I, for example, would say Jeremy Corbyn should be reinstated to the PLP. He's already reinstated as a Labour member. Um, I don't think that should get me prescribed. So there will be people who associate with these groups because they feel a sense of injustice about one case that doesn't necessarily cut across to other cases that are more clear cut. Uh, and I think there's a danger of this. And you've seen um, Rosie's colleague, uh, Neil Coyle, for example, who's obviously factionally on a very different wing of the party to myself, uh, calling for other groups to be prescribed. And this is where this ends, I think. And there's a danger that the Labour Party spends the entirety of the next few years fighting amongst itself rather than fighting the extremists in government at the moment. Rosie? Good point, actually. Yeah, I mean, of course, there are going to be people that are pro Jeremy Corbyn who aren't anti the party. But, you know, those of us that have been sort of on the front line during the Corbyn years have had a pretty difficult time. And I think just getting us all back to, to broadly supportive, supporting the party that we're all members of would be a great idea. Are you a member of any of these groups, Andrew? I'm not, no. I have to say, I had to look up a couple of them. I mean, it seems to me that a couple, a couple of them are for people who have left the Labour Party anyway, so I'm not quite sure what the purpose is of expelling people who have already left. Right. I mean, I would you consider joining any of them, the ones you've heard of? No. I mean, I've known Socialist Appeal, for example, which is on there, which is a kind of... Um, is the pro-Labour split-off from militant uh, in the late... Sorry, early 90s. Mm. That's been, you know, in the Labour Party since under John Smith, under Tony Blair... Under Miliband, under Gordon Brown, you know, under Jeremy Corbyn, of course, as well, and under Keir Starmer today. I, I don't understand what it's suddenly done in the last few months that means it's got to be prescribed. So, I mean, it does feel a little dodgy. I mean, you've got to look at these things on a case by case basis, of course. But, um, you know, the last time there was any real prescription of organisations was around Militant, and that was an entirely different organisation that was trying to, you know, take over the Labour Party right. and, and you know, had its own MPs, had its own policy programme that it's... Well, MPs isn't that the point... Isn't different to anything today. Right, but isn't that the point here, that if you're at odds with what the Labour Party stands for and Labour Party values, however that is constituted, then surely you can't necessarily be part of the Labour group? Of course, but Labour's always been a broad church. You know, when... Oh. when Jeremy Corbyn was leader. There were lots of people arguing for a completely different direction for the party. When Tony Blair was leader, there were people arguing for a different direction then. We've always been a broad church that embraces a, a kind of diversity within boundaries, you know, from social democrats to democratic socialists. All right. That's well, we're... Always been OK, I mean, I... All right, well, let me just show you this tweet uh, from John McDonnell, who is on your wing of the party. Uh, obviously, Andrew, or you are on his as the former Shadow Chancellor. Standard Blairite fair to try and show how strong a leader you are by taking on your own party. But be bizarre to do it by expelling people, most of whom have left already. Looks desperate when what is needed is restoration of whip to Jeremy Corbyn, publication of Ford and taking on Tories. Is he right, Rosie? Um, I don't think so, no. I think, you know, it would be great to have us more united, but this broad church argument is always... <laughs> always brought out by by factional people and we're so broad we need to at least stand for some of the same things we cannot provide an effective opposition if we don't know what we stand for and we're not we're still arguing about that and who our leader is and all of that f forever we, we just look ridiculous and ineffective at the moment and Keir is trying to to sort of curtail that and to make us look united and that's a good step in the right direction I mean Andrew if I look at one of the groups resist set up by Chris Williamson former uh, Labour MP after he was suspended they have said that anti-Semitism claims were exaggerated and were reported as having ambitions of becoming their own separate party. People may ask, what do you have to do in your mind to be a prescribed organisation? Well, but by definition, they've set, set themselves up outside the party if they're thinking about being another political party. So prescribing them is, is like prescribing the Green Party or something. You know, <laughs> they're going to be a different political party. They're already outside the party. You know, I've got no truck with Chris Williams and I think he's a complete shyster. It's like a pound oh, shop George. Watch Gatt the language, please. I think shite is Well, right, it might it? be. It might be. But just let's try and remember its okay. daytime. Don't worry. I'm not telling you off. OK. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd chase them. Uh, no, don't feel too chased. But, um, um, <laughs> but listen, let me bring the... Let me bring the up. Yeah, go on. Sorry, finish your point. I think there are organisations like that. Clearly, if they tried to come into the Labour Party, that would be an issue. But, I mean, I don't really know. I suspect it's ten people and a dog, really. Um, I don't suppose it's any organisation of any size or scale that Labour needs to be worried about. And the party, you know, to come back on, on Rosie's point, the party is broadly united. I mean, Keir won a mandate for a policy platform, which we've heard hired no air of since, um, that united people. He won 56% of the vote. You know, but the party was united. What we're lacking, actually, is any sense of leadership or direction from the leader. Uh, Polly, what impact do you think this will have? 
I, I think, you know, the key thing for Keir Starmer as a leader is to spend as much time as possible talking about the change he wants to make in the country. And inevitably, in party factionalism, distracts from that. The question is whether making this move reduces factionalism in the long term. Uh, it's sort of, you know, just pulling off the plaster or whatever it, it is, or whether it creates a kind of a further tension ongoing. I, one kind of theoretical point, it's fascinating to hear Andrew talk about individuals being the, the kind of locus of, of, of proscription rather than groups. But it seems to me that one of the things that the Labour Party understands best of all is that groups acting collectively have different impacts to individuals and that you, therefore you might need to act on a group rather than simply acting on individuals if the behaviour is is problematic, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on. Uh, Ian, is this important for Keir Starmer? I think it's incredibly important. Uh, and I think all of his actions and words now have to be directed at Mrs Megan's 32 occasion at Avenue uh, Halifax, because she's the type of voter that is either going to get Labour back into power mm -hmm. or not. All of these seats that Labour have lost um, since 2005, most of them have to be won back. Now, Mrs Megan's doesn't really care about internal factional politics, but she does care if she thinks that the Labour Party is being taken over by what she perceives as communists. And at least one of these organisations I read in the paper this morning, that is that is the allegation. Now, all political parties are coalitions, broad churches. Um, you, you do have groups from all over the political spectrum, but there have to be limits. And I think Keir Starmer's doing exactly the right thing. Yes, Andrew's right, it is a bit out of the Tony Blair playbook, but hey, he won three general elections. Uh, a lot of Labour people seem to forget that. Right. Uh, on Ian's point, Andrew? Well, Tony Blair inherited a 20-point polling lead from John Smith. It did, so but I, think, I meant the point before, actually, the sorry. I meant the point Sam before, though, about, about Mrs Miggins. Well, Mrs Miggins, if she lives in Halifax, already has a Labour MP, Holly Lynch, who's very good. That's not one of the seats we need to win back right. to be a pet. Take one of the it. others, then. <laughs> but, you know, um, I think the problem is we're not speaking to the country. I think a lot of the people, you know, uh, there was a poll out for Ipsos Mori earlier this month that said 46% of Labour voters don't think Keir Starmer's the right person to lead us into the next general election. Now, whether I agree with that or disagree with that, that's not a good sign. All Labour's right. polling, you go about today, it puts us at 13 points behind. Now, 2019 was a disastrous election for us, but it was 11 points behind. We're going backwards, and that's a big problem, and this doesn't help us move forward. Andrew Fisher, thank you. We're going to talk about Ian Dale, our guest's book. You can see the front page there, the title, uh, Prime Minister Pretty. Now, it is, the book imagines, what might have happened if certain political events had gone differently. Interestingly, that chapter, which I think is the final chapter, Ian, is actually casting ahead, isn't it, to the future if she becomes uh, Prime Minister. Why did you write it? Uh, it was a bit of fun, really. I, I think all counterfactual history or count, counterfactual sort of th things that ha might happen in the future, they're, they're based on a degree of fact, um, but and, and they're often sliding doors moments. Sort of what would have happened, for example, if JFK hadn't been assassinated in November 1963? Would would he be seen in history as a great president or not? There are all sorts of these, and th th we've done. Fi this is the fifth volume of this book. There's 23 different essays in it. Quite a few of them are sort of from modern times, but you've got ones going back in history about sort of what if what if um, Ireland hadn't been neutral in the Second World War, that sort of thing. Mm. So. I wrote the Pretty Patel chapter as a bit of fun. I wrote it as fiction, um, but but um, it's based on a little bit of... I mean, it could happen, let's face it. Well, is that a scenario you'd like to see play out, Connor? I read it yesterday. It's, it's great fun. Um, I think it's the premise of it is wrong, <laughs> and that is that Boris is going to get fed up and walk off into the sunset in about two years' time. I can assure you the Prime Minister's appetite for the job and appetite to see the job through is absolutely undiminished, despite all the challenges we've had over the last year. I, I say to Ian, slightly tongue-in-cheek, he, he basically took every single right-wing backbencher and put them in Pretty's cabinet. I don't know if I've moved too far to the middle, Ian. I wasn't in it. I've perhaps gone soft in my, in my middle age. Pretty's a great talent, and the left, the left hate her because she defies so many of the stereotypes. Uh, a centre-right Asian lady standing up for uh, good conservative values. But it's a great book. I, I'm going to buy it. As I buy all Ian's books. They're very, very good. Well, one of the other what-ifs, uh, Rosie, is if Rebecca Long-Bailey had beaten Keir Starmer in the leadership election. Um, before I get your response, so what, what were you trying to uh, look into there, Ian? 
Oh, um, I, I didn't write that chapter. Paul Richards did. He, he's somebody who was a special advisor in Gordon Brown's government, very much of the Blairite tendency. So there, there's some very funny little asides that he puts in there. Um, and, and it's looking at effectively what would have happened, not particularly with Rebecca Long-Bailey, but if that part of the Labour Party that Andrew Fisher represents had uh, gained control. Uh, and effectively, he's saying, well, they would have then lost another election and another election. And then he posits a leadership campaign in 2027 between West Streeting and Zara Sultana, really the left versus the right. Right. Well, you're laughing there, Rosie. What's your view about that? What if? I think this is going to be a welcome relief from the real real life of politics at the moment. I mean, satire is incredibly difficult to write. <laughs> I know, I tried to do it before I got elected. This is even worse at the moment because we're living through this bizarre, surreal political age. And um, hats off to Ian for having a go, and I can't wait to have a read of it. But, um, yeah, I don't know if that scenario will ever happen. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, um, one of the other things, Polly, is um, if the COVID response had been led by a woman. In that scenario, Theresa May teams up with Lisa Nandy, obviously a former Conservative Prime Minister, uh, and Lisa Nandy on the shadow team for Labour to lead a more cross-party response. Do you think the response would have been different under a female leader? I sort of hesitate to, to, feminist though I am, to sort of say, oh, women are better at this stuff. Because I think actually when we make these gender stereotypes, that's a problem. But I, I do think a, a cross-party approach would have been incredibly beneficial and important to hold the country together. You know, there was that sense uh, in the very early days that this was something which we would do together. And I think there's been too much uh, factionalism and, and oppositionalism on both sides, actually. And that's that's made it harder for us to learn lessons and come together. So, but, you know, I'm a sort of soggy centrist, so I'm always in favour of cross-party working. Um, and I hope that we get it on, you know, on social care, on climate change. I, I would much rather see our parliament operate to tackle the great national challenges with the view that everybody in parliament has been elected and has a legitimate voice, instead of thinking you can only get things through if you get the votes from your side, because the other guys are evil. But did you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm very much a, a cross-party person, and I think we only do get these huge things tackled if we work together. You know, we might only have this particular government for another few years, and then it's our turn for five years. You know, you can't make long-term goals realistically like that. It, I mean, that's a very simplistic way of putting it, but I think most people want us to kind of get along and solve these huge crises together. Actually. Right. Well, let's wind back a little bit uh, to one big decision that was made, because one chapter, Ian, looks at what would have happened if Remain had one in that referendum in 2016. And actually, it turns out, the chapter quite similarly to real life. David Cameron resigns a year after that referendum. Boris Johnson becomes Prime Minister and wins a big election victory on a pledge to level up the north of England. What did you make of that chapter? Well, I thought it was interesting in that, as you say, it ended up in exactly the same position that we are today. Oh, and obviously, the, the, the European issue would still be a divisive one because if Remain had won 52-48, uh, Nathan Morley, who, who wrote the chapter, he posits that, well, Nigel Farage would not have gone away. He wouldn't now be a, a presenter on, on GB News. He would be still leading the campaign to get Britain out of the European Union. And Boris Johnson would probably have been elected leader of the Conservative Party on, on a mandate. I mean, Nathan says he wouldn't have been specific about a, another referendum, but he would have given a nod and a wink to people who would want one. So I actually thought that was one of the, the most insightful chapters in the book. We'll never know what would have happened oh, on all of, of these course, chapters. We, the can, we can never know, but that they all represent a pretty good guess at what might have happened in different circumstances. Well, let's briefly imagine all of us. Would we have been in a similar situation, uh, Connor, if uh, Remain had won? I mean, the honest answer is who on earth... Uh, can tell. I just feel actually slightly queasy just rethinking that dreadful referendum and the events after it and just thank God it's behind us. I think an interesting book to be written is how on earth the Remain campaign ran such an atrocious campaign um, because there were so many good arguments. I remember talking to Dan Hannan about this. If we were in charge of the Remain campaign, the sort of arguments we would advance, which would be very, very different than Project Fear. Polly? Yeah, I mean, I think relatively, uh, books have been written about that. Mm. Uh, it, I don't know, it, it, it's... It, it, books like Ian's are kind of so fascinating because they, they help you to understand quite how fragile our reality is. I always like the Terry Pratchett analogy that there are sort of infinite trouser legs of history. And, yeah. and, and in a way, as a kind of campaigner, it, it helps me to feel that there is always the hope for change. You can always be making a difference, even with, you know, small things that we do might just be pulling that lever on the train lines and setting the train in a more positive direction. 
Rosie, briefly. Yeah, I mean, I'm still remaining away in Parliament and we're beginning to see the, the effects, so um, I'd w I wish Remain had left. <laughs> what was that? Sort of massive opportunity. <laughs> I wish Remain had well, still. Well, but... Ramon away. Um, that's all we've got time for. Thank you to all of my guests. And, of course, I will be back with Prime Minister's Questions at 11.15 tomorrow. Bye-bye.